the Acts of the Apostles, just three verses for study, but if you will bear with me, I'd like to read the previous 12 verses by way of introduction. We've studied these first 12 verses some weeks ago. It's Acts chapter 13, the beginning of the first missionary journey. So, our study is in verses 13 to 15 of the chapter, but we read from the first verse, Acts chapter 13. Now, in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaen, a member of the court of Herod the Tetrach, and Saul. While they were worshipping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then, after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So, being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, And from there they sailed to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they had John to assist them. John Mark, of course. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus, son of salvation. He was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence, who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elimas, the magician, for that is the meaning of his name, withstood them, seeking to turn away the proconsul from the faith. But Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the law? And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. Immediately mist and darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed. There's no reason for us to doubt that Sergius Paulus truly believed. That's what it says. The proconsul believed when he saw what had occurred, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. And now our verses for this morning. Now Paul and his company set sail from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia. And John left them and returned to Jerusalem. But they passed on from Perga and came to Antioch, of Pisidia. And on the Sabbath day they went into the synagogue and sat down. After the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent to them, saying, Brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say it. This is God's word. We are still then in the early days of Paul's first missionary journey. A few weeks ago, we looked together at Barnabas and Saul taking the gospel to Cyprus. And with our reading this morning, we begin to deal with what happened afterwards, especially, of course, what happened at Poseidon Antioch. But I want to slow everything down in the few minutes that we have this morning. Our time has gone very quickly during this service. But in any case, I would like us to slow down so that we can um, look at one of those verses in the Bible which are heavily loaded. Now, I'm referring to verse 13, 
which contains what looks at first almost like a giveaway statement by Luke where he says that John left them and returned to Jerusalem. Now that is something that we cannot fully understand, of course, until we read on and then looking backwards we can see the tremendous significance of that statement. John left them and returned to Jerusalem. It's John Mark, of course. But it all begins with a very simple statement of fact. Having begun a real work of the gospel on Cyprus, which, remember, was the native island of Barnabas, the two now cross from Paphos to the south coast of Paul's native land. He's been called Paul for the first time. That is in Asia Minor. But then this verse goes on. At first sight, seeming as if to state no more than another fact, another fact in passing. John Mark left them or departed from them and returned to Jerusalem. Why did he leave them? And under what circumstances? Now, we have to ask that question, and we'll have to deal with it later in our studies, because it's very clear that Paul regarded this as an act of desertion. Can I draw your attention to chapter 15 of Acts? Perhaps you could flip over one page. And just look again at this from verse 36. After some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Come, let us return and visit the brethren in every city where we have proclaimed the word of the Lord and see how they are. And Barnabas wanted to take with them John called Mark, but Paul thought best not to take with them one who had withdrawn from them. It's a strong word that means deserted them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. And there arose a sharp contention, so that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended by the brethren to the grace of the Lord. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Now, I don't think it's just the case that Paul and Luke thought this was a desertion. I think Barnabas also agreed that John Mark had deserted the work of the Lord and deserted his servants. Now, I don't want to jump too far ahead. We'll see what that is all about when we come to chapter 15. We'll see what the disagreement was all about. We'll see also how honest Luke is in his record. And we'll see how this did not spoil the relationship between Paul and Barnabas for the future, largely due to the big-heartedness of Barnabas. But we have to know what lies ahead to make sense of what's said here about John's departure. Why did he desert them? Now, Paul and Barnabas, as I've just said, didn't disagree over this interpretation of what John did. What they do disagree with later is over the matter of what should be done, whether John Mark should be allowed to continue in the Lord's work and join them for a second journey. And does that tell us then something of why John Mark chose to desert Paul and Barnabas at this stage? Now, we are not told why. And perhaps it's wrong of us to speculate. But it's clear that there could only be one of two things operating here, isn't it? Either it's a matter of John Mark just not being up to it, or not up to it at this time, not ready for it, not ready for the danger, not willing to pay the price that was set upon this missionary outreach. Perhaps he didn't relish the thought of the rigors of a pioneering preaching life. And there are many who are attracted to Christ. 
who are drawn towards a real faith in Jesus Christ, but find that sticking to it is too costly. There are many, there always will be many, who choose to go back to whatever is their Jerusalem. How many people do that? Start off well and then turn away. Won't go all the way with Jesus Christ. There are people who seem to spend their lives in terms of Christian things, always close to the kingdom. That's the kind of language we use in Christian circles to describe them. They're close to the kingdom. They're almost there. They're nearly converted. They're coming to the Lord, but they spend their lives always coming to the Lord and never come. Now, I'm not saying that I know that John Mark was like that. I don't really think he was. But what he did here indicates that kind of spirit, doesn't it? Always coming, but never actually coming to the Lord. There are many people in Acts whose story tells that too. But if this is not all that there is to know about John Mark, and I doubt if it is, then why? Some people say he was just plain homesick. I don't think that's good enough, do you? Some people say that he at this time at least was one of the Jewish conservatives, and he was annoyed at what Paul and Barnabas were doing in preaching the gospel now freely and openly, and sometimes firstly to Gentiles, not to Jews, And he went back to join his conservative friends in Jerusalem. And perhaps they say he was even one of those who stirred up trouble for Paul later. The Bible doesn't tell us that, though. Perhaps someone has suggested that he was concerned for Paul, for Paul's health, because Paul was sick. Remember, he arrived in Galatia and he was in no fit state. Perhaps he disagreed with them over this matter. That's just speculation. And I think Luke is giving us a gentle clue here in the language of the book of Acts. It changes, doesn't it? Have you noticed that what has been up until now, Barnabas and Saul, chapter 9, becomes Paul and Barnabas by chapter 13. It's Barnabas, you remember, who takes Paul's part in Jerusalem when everyone else was against him. It's Barnabas who seeks out Paul in Tarsus and brings him into the work. This is a great man, Barnabas. A great encourager indeed. But when the church in Antioch sends them out, Luke refers to them firstly as Barnabas and Saul, and then by this chapter he changes it, and from now on it's Paul and his company. Verse 13 again. So is John Mark, who, remember, is the cousin of Barnabas, is he resentful of this? Is his nose put out of joint that his cousin, who has led the mission so far, should now be asked to follow Paul? Now, whereas Barnabas was prepared to play second fiddle, that's the mark of the man's greatness, that he was willing not to be great. Maybe John Mark was not up to it at this time not up to being last. And there does seem to be something of that here. Oh, not in the part of Barnabas. That's the important thing to see. But John Mark may not have accepted Paul's leadership. And when Paul and Barnabas disagree later, it is not even then over the question of leadership or what the place of Barnabas should be But it's about someone else. It's about John Mark again. And so we see once more the big-heartedness of Barnabas. And that's what we should stress, the generosity of this man. My friends, the Christian church is not a democracy. I know we have a society which worships the sacred cow of democracy. Everything's got to be democratic and voted upon, but the church of Jesus is not a democracy. 
The church of Jesus is made up of women and men who are each one called into a position of service, not voted in. And if we accept God's leadership, then we must also accept that God continues to appoint leaders. Barnabas accepted this. Perhaps at this time, John Mark stumbled over it. But there's another thing. Isn't it always the case that there are those around the Christian church who resent leadership? Always those around who don't like the place God is giving to them and want another one. Think of the way the disciples continually argued just outside the presence of the Lord, barely out of his hearing, so that even coming down from the Mount of Transfiguration, he found them arguing about who was going to be first. And they to learn the lesson of last first and first last and God's leadership always. Barnabas was a great soul. He's one of my great heroes in the New Testament. He accepted God's will, and he accepted it, it would seem, gladly and without a single murmur about him being now the second fiddle. And without his obedience to God, and without his acceptance of Paul's place in God's leading, this missionary journey would have stopped right here. And there wouldn't have been a second either, And there would perhaps have been a severely divided church from the beginning. John Mark's little rebellion would have ruined the work, possibly. That's often the case when people walk out in the huff. That's really what people are hoping for when they go in the huff, to draw others, to draw people like Barnabas who are faithful away and spoil the whole work. It's the kind of thing that children do, you know. It's my ball, and if you won't follow my rules, I'm going home and my ball's going with me. We laugh at it, but it's in our nature. It's a human characteristic. It's childish. It is non-Christian. And when the John Marks of this world desert, their going asks us the question, will we stay on? Will we be the Barnabas that we should be? Now, John Mark learned. He grew up as a Christian. He was given that opportunity by God through his cousin Barnabas once more. But this incident in his life asks us the question, what do we do when other people desert? Are we going to stand firm? Aye, but are we going to stand firm even if that means accepting a low place? Stand firm knowing that God will bless that as God most certainly blessed his beloved Barnabas. A great deal turns upon the faithfulness of this man. Now, when I say faithfulness, his faithfulness to God included a great selflessness. Don't you think so? He was a great-hearted man for others. He cared. He seems to understand what it means to be put out. He brings Paul in, and when Paul wants to keep Mark out, he brings John Mark in. He's generous and he's humble and he's a peacemaker and he's one of whom Jesus would say he should be called a son of God. An awful lot turns upon the faithfulness of Barnabas. Not just the second missionary journey, but a great deal more. Mark's gospel. (laughs) The unity of the church. The whole work of mission. And it's also a mark of Paul's greatness. Do you remember that later when he writes to the Colossians, he stresses the fact that John Mark is to be accepted. See that you accept him. I've given you special instructions. Don't leave him out, he says, so that when he writes the second time to Timothy, he says, oh, this man, John Mark, is of very great usefulness to me. Get Mark. Get Mark, says Paul. And all because of Barnabas' great-hearted generosity. 
and what God could do with that. God blessed these men. Even when John Mark left them, you, did you notice the invitation in verse 15? Brothers, if you have any word of exhortation to the people, say it, and all oh, they did. We'll see that, I hope, next week. What openness, what an invitation to preach the gospel. But much now would turn upon the love and the generosity of Barnabas. God's work went on, not least because one man was glad to play second fiddle when God said, that's your place. Are we up to that? Do you and I truly see that it can be the big thing to accept the small part? And do we see how important in the plans and purposes of God our contribution can be, even if we sometimes feel that other folks are more important than us and that what we are doing is just not appreciated? That's the kind of feeling that leads us to demand our place and to have things our way. It's called self, and it's called pride. And in the end, we'll have the gospel to our way of things and our likings if we're not careful. You know, people that one sermon in ten will say, well, it was okay, I like that, meaning that was up to my standards. What about God's? What about the standards of the word? And I leave you with this thought this morning. Perhaps you are considering much just now. I hope very much you are in prayer for the future of this congregation, for our work and our fellowship. Have you thought that that might depend less on the leadership than upon the support of every member? Have you thought that it might depend less upon me in the pulpit than upon you and your function as an encourager? Of course, it needs both. But we're talking about degrees, aren't we? In any case, how is it with you, with me? Are we the way John Mark was at this time, probably a little resentful and rebellious? Or are we like Barnabas, humbly accepting our part and our place and our job as these have been given us by God? It's when we learn this kind of lesson that we learn to value each other, honor each other above ourselves as we are told to do. It's thus that we accept God's place and God's work for us. And I believe it is then that we shall grow and be used by God. And others will be encouraged and will be used by God too. And if you haven't already thought about it, then also we will be fitted for greater things. Let us pray. Almighty God, as we thank you for every example set in your word of great-hearted humility, we must thank you above all for the example of the person and life of our Savior, who chose to wash his disciples' feet, who chose to come not to be served but to serve, and who gave his life a ransom for many. Father, if we are truly seeking his way, Help us to recognize that this is his way, the way of service, the way of true humility, that we might be together encouragers and enablers for the work of the gospel, not only in this place, but in many others, wherever you shall send us. For Jesus' sake, amen.